Ah, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ah, thank you, Dad. I knew I could count on you. <laughs> anyway, it must be time for my video. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Oh, hello there people. Now, you may be thinking, God, Benito's fiddling around with filming locations again. Well, you'd be right, but to be honest with you, I've, it suddenly struck me that why do I have to go up and stand by a wall when I can sit in my favourite chair of all time and do my videos? So, I think I thought sensibly this time. Now, today we're going to be discussing whether animals can count. Now, as you can imagine, counting can be very useful in the animal kingdom. For example, to count how many chicks you have, if you're a female mallard, for example. Or if you're a bee, maybe it's useful to count the number of landmarks you're passing before you reach a particularly nice food resource or get back to your hive. Yeah? Also, in chimpanzees, right? Chimpanzees are extremely... they hang around in groups. And if they hear any neighbouring groups approaching their territory, then they'll go out and murder them, right? Lovely. Now, if you're a lone male, so if, so if, you're a, if you're a chimp and you're by yourself, the last thing you want to do is to make a sound. You don't want to give off any call whatsoever, because then your neighbours will come up and have you for dinner, right? Now, in this study done by one of my lecturers, Nigel Franks, and his colleagues, they played lone male calls to chimpanzee groups of different sizes in the Uganda forest, right? And they measured the approach velocity of the chimps to the speakers, right? And they found that the larger the chimpanzee group was, the faster they approached the speakers. And this can be um, modelled uh, mathematically. And you can also work out that the chance of an individual being injured is much less if you're in a group of a larger size. So, when relating it back to the topic of this video, then being able to count or have some sort of idea of abundance of the amount of chimpanzees in your group can be extremely useful. Now, what's even more interesting is that for many years, people didn't even dare go near the subject of animals being able to count. And this was all due to this idea of the clever hands effect, right? Now, clever hands was a horse. Clever hands was a horse, and his owner was absolutely convinced that he could count and even do simple mathematical problems, okay? All he needed to do was clunk his hoof the right amount of times, and he'd get the right answer, right? And obviously he'd get some food reward if he got the right answer. And, you know, he became a local celeb at the time. But it was actually a young, bright psychology student that realised what could actually be going on here. He realised as soon as Clever Hands was clunking the right answer with his feet, the owner would lean forward a little bit, OK? And that would result in Clever Hands stopping clunking his hoof, because then he'd get a reward. OK, so this was a subliminal signal. So, probably not true counting at all. Okay, but first, before we go into any more detail, definition time. What is counting? Right. <clears throat> counting is determining the number of items in a group by assigning successive numbers to its members. Okay, and there are two important to points to make here that being able to count actually relies upon, okay? It's based on an abstract notion of number, so you need to have an abstract notion of number, and it doesn't involve summation, okay? For example, the odometer in a car, right, isn't counting, is it? Because it doesn't have any abstract idea of number, and it's just summing a continuous variable. Therefore, counting mustn't be confused with simpler measures of abundance, right? Now, a great example was a study done by Carbon et al. on cicadas. Now, cicadas live underground as larvae at, um, near tree roots, right, for 17 years. For exactly 17 years before they emerge as adults. Now, I assume, 
I mean, I, I don't want to judge, but most of you wouldn't think for a second that these cicadas are actually counting the number of years that they're spent underground, right? They're not going, okay, that's one year gone, that's two, that's three, okay? So there's clearly something else going on here. So experiments were done which involved shortening the annual cycles, because obviously doing an experiment and waiting 17 years would take a bloody long time. So what they did, they shortened the annual cycles of the plant so it looked as if 17 years had gone past. And they found out that the cicadas still emerged after 17 years. So they definitely weren't measuring any time. They weren't measuring time here. However, what the cicadas could have been doing was monitoring the annual ebb and flow of amino acids and other compounds in the xylem juices of the plant. So, this could be some sort of physiological system that adds a quantity to some chemical token, right? And it carries on doing this until an innate threshold is reached by which point that triggers some change in the metabolism or whatever of the cicada, causing it to pupate and change into an adult, right? So this is therefore not counting at all. In fact, it's probably summation. It okay, we're gonna stick with insects now and move on to ants. And this was a study also done by my lecturer, Nigel Franks, right? And the species studied was a species of ant which is commonly used in experiments like this, it's Temnothorax albipennis, and it's a species that we'll be covering um, later in the series as well. Okay. So these ants were given a choice of nest sites, right? They were given a binary choice, so there was two options. And the only thing that differed between the two nest sites was the number of entrances. Nothing else. One had one entrance, and one had five, right? And they showed the ants preferred going to the nest with one entrance because if there's only one entrance that means it's much easier to defend, right? There's less entrances for intruders to get in. However, a slight mistake was done in this experiment because when constructing the nest sites they used the same filter. Well, they thought they were using the same filter each time. It was a red filter. But instead in one of the experiments, they changed it to an orange filter. They looked very similar, but kind of different. And that makes all the difference, because the orange filter let more light in. Okay? And once the orange filter was used, then the pattern that we were observing before disappeared completely. Okay? Because if an orange lighter filter was used, then all the ants need to do is measure the amount of light that's coming in. Okay? So we want as little light going in as possible, because that's an indicator on how many entrances there are, okay? So it's like when you're getting a new house, right? You don't necessarily count the number of windows, do you? You normally just have an idea on how much light is coming in. So summing a continuous variable, not counting. Okay, so going to an experiment on pigeons now. Now, pigeons were trained to press a button a certain number of times before a light came on, right? Now, they were either trained to press it 45 or 50 times. Okay, if the light came on after 45 times, then they had to press a button to the left. If it came on after 50 times, they had to press a button to the right. And this was successful, but we may be overcomplicating this whole situation. We must, once again, be applying Morgan's canon. It's likely that these sort of panic complex feats can be explained by a lower process. Right? So, for example, the pigeon could just be have an idea on the amount of time it had spent pecking. Right? Or it could just be summing a continuous variable. For example, an analog measure of stress. So, to put this in perspective, you imagine you're lifting some weights, right, and you're, it's getting really tiring, and you're like, oh, I'll have one more, I'll have one more. Well, your muscle isn't counting, is it? It's just building up lactic acid. So, it's sending information to your brain that, you know, you shouldn't really lift it anymore. Okay? Right, now here is possibly the cutest example of all. So, come on, let's put, keep ourselves together, shall we? Now, Rocky the raccoon is a raccoon in, the well, I think, in the USA. And he was trained to open Perspex boxes only if they have three objects in them. Okay? Now, these three objects could have been grapes, which Rocky was allowed to eat. 
if you opened them. Or they could have been ball bearings. And if they were ball bearings, then Rocky was allowed to wash them. Because, you know, he's quite good in that sense, you know, he likes to keep things clean. Now, he could have been counting. But another thing you could have been doing, and this is without doubt the best vid the best word you'll hear in this whole series, right? He could have been subitizing. Right? Now, what is subitizing? I've got a definition here. It's subitizing is measuring abundance at a glance. And to demonstrate what I mean, I'm going to roll a dice now, and you, as are my attentive audience members, are going to shout out the number on the dice. Okay? Three, two, one, go! Right, how did you do? Probably pretty well, I'd imagine, because you were subitizing. You weren't, probably weren't, counting the number of dots on the dice, were you? You just knew what a one, two, three, four, five, and a six look like on a dice. Okay? That's what subitizing is. And, but it only works for really small numbers. Well, for us, anyway. Oh, what's happened? Change your lighting. Change your clothes. <laughs> God, I don't know what happened there. I mean, obviously, here on the show, we're very pernickety about continuity, so I'm too apologetic, but I don't know what happened. But anyway, counting. We're gonna get back onto insects now. So these bees, and our favorite honey bee biologist is obviously Chitka, and another guy called Geiger wants to see whether bees could proto-count landmarks. This is having a sense of counting, but in a way that isn't transferable to another situation. So it's just used for counting landmarks. So the bees are trained to feed at an artificial feeder after passing a certain number of landmarks. And in this case, it was um, yellow tents. <laughs> okay then. Um, so they altered the spacing of these um, tents and they train the bees just to go after, let's say, four tents, right? Now, you may be thinking, maybe they could smell the food, and they weren't actually counting the landmarks. Well, they, the Chitka and Geiger are one step ahead of you because they actually had a control where they just use a clear um, jar with no honey, whatever, was in it at all, okay? So sometimes they put that in. So that's just to control for any other factors that could be affecting the bees coming down to land. So these bees flew down to a control feeder after a particular number of landmarks, irrespective of how spaced apart those landmarks were. So this looked like pretty convincing evidence. However, this isn't necessarily counting. So as soon as this paper was released, another scientist called Srinivasan um, wanted to state something different. He thought that the bees in this experiment weren't actually counting. In fact, he thought that bees measured distance in terms of optical flow. So, instead of counting, they were probably just measuring the number of, let's say, if they were yellow tents, yellow pixels, if you like, until they reached a certain innate threshold, right? So, just like the cicadas, this is a case of summation, okay? It's an innate mechanism. The Srinivasan came up with a completely different experimental design. They got bees to fly through a sort of tunnel with different yellow landmarks, okay? And the nature of these landmarks were changed, the spacing of them was changed, and baffles were put in between the landmarks, and this prevents any subitizing going on. Oh, I still love that word! And the results of this study seem pretty convincing, but they can be a bit deceiving, because if a peak on the graph indicates that the bees have learned, then there are more bees that haven't learned, okay? So even though the, the, more, the, the peak is where bees have learned, on either side of that peak there are loads of bees which haven't learned at all. Now probably one of the most convincing studies to show that animals can count was done by Mech and Church on rats. Okay, and this indicates that these rats have some concept of an abstract notion of number. Because a rat can learn to assess the number of light flashes or audible tones that they're exposed to, and then they can learn to press a lever left or right accordingly, depending on how many of each stimulus they were exposed to. And obviously this lever will present them with some sort of tasty food reward, right? But they can also respond to mixed stimuli. So obviously, sometimes 
they were just exposed to light flashes and sometimes they were just exposed to audible tones. But if they mixed it up, so if they gave one light flash, then one audible tone and so on and so on, then they could still assess how many um, stimuli they had just witnessed and press the lever the right way accordingly. Now the gap between the light flashes and the sounds, the duration of the sounds, and the pressure on the lever were all altered just to control for any other factors other than counting. And because these rats were isolated, they're on their own, they didn't have access to any unwitting signals from their owners, right? So this is evidence that these rats do have an abstract notion of number. And when you think of intelligent birds, perhaps one of the first things that spring to mind are parrots. Right? They're pretty intelligent, they can speak, some of them. And Alex, the African grey parrot, was a bit of a celebrity in his day. Unfortunately, he's passed away now. Oh, long rest his soul. But his legacy carries on as one of the most intelligent birds on Earth. So, what he did, he was shown different objects, and he was asked to count, if you like, or just state how many of a particular object there were. And these were heterogeneous collections. What I mean by that were that Often, there were two different coloured objects and two different shapes, okay, so I don't know, a, a square and a sphere, okay, so there were four groups in total, yeah, so it could have been a red square and a red sphere or a blue sphere and a blue square, okay, got me? And these heterogeneous collections were very difficult for him to supertize, right? Now I've got his result statistics here. God, let's hear he did. So Alex's results show that 83.3% overall accuracy. And this is discussed in terms of their relation to human numerical competence. Okay? However, it could just be that Parrots, or Alex in particular, is just particularly good at supertizing. Maybe he's better at supertizing than humans. So maybe he's not actually counting. Okay, so back to primates then. Rhesus monkeys were trained to press a screen in numerical order. And on the screen, there are objects, um, well, of different quantities, obviously, but these could have been of different sizes, different shapes, etc. And it shows that the monkeys can do this in the order 1, 2, 3, and 4, although it does require a lot of training. And also, they can pull them in the right order in a novel set of panels. So, for example, if they were given... 1, 4, 7, and 8, they could put them in order, right? So the monkeys clearly understand the principle of ordinality, and this had no clever hands effect associated with it at all. Okay, so some really good studies there that perhaps animals do have an abstract notion of number which doesn't involve any summation, okay? But we've got to think about it in terms of what use it will be in the wild. Going back to our Temnothorax albipennis with the ants, do ants need to count the number of entrances um, to their nests? No, not really. They can just measure the amount of light that's coming in and therefore make a decision that way. Sometimes analogue measures are much simpler than digital, right? Because digital counting requires a lot of abstraction, which is a lot more complex. Okay, so in the similar to the words of Albert Einstein, right, okay, so not everything that counts and might be counted needs to be counted, okay, so sometimes analogue is simpler, easier and quicker, okay. Right, so that's all we've got time for, next time we're going to be talking about where animals have language, right, cool, really stepping up in the world, see you then.